Hello and welcome to another video. So in this video, we'll be talking about the idea of complex numbers. So complex numbers on its own will take forever to cover. It, this is an entire course on its own and people do PhDs on this stuff. So the idea of complex numbers in the context of linear algebra will only be a very restricted kind of subsection. So I'm not going to cover all of it, that would take forever. But I will cover some parts of it because it'll be important later on when we talk about complex vector spaces. So what exactly is a complex number? Well, around the 18th century or so, it turns out that for many practical purposes, such as circuit theory, like so, vibrations, and many other things, the idea of complex numbers kind of lets you visualize the phenomena of circuits and vibrations and many other things much more intuitively than the real number system. So what exactly is a complex number exactly? So a complex number, so let me just go ahead and write this down. So a complex number is a number such that in the form z equals a plus bi. So a is known as the real part of z and b is equal to, let me just go ahead and make that a bit better, right there, b is equal to the imaginary part of, uh, part of z. Okay, so what does real and imaginary mean? How does this all kind of tie in together? Well, the idea is that complex numbers lets us extend our understanding of numbers to the next level. So earlier, if I give you the polynomial x squared, um, let's see, minus 1 equals 0, this is easy to solve because you can move the 1 to the other side and take the square root of both sides. So this will give us x equals plus or minus 1. That was fine. However, and now we have a, if the situation was a little bit different, so if that was a plus sign, for example, here we have a problem. Because now we can't really solve this using the real numbers. And the reason for that is because the square root of negative 1 is not a real number. So this cannot be done as of now. But now, what we're going to do is extend our understanding of this so that questions like theirs are actually possible to solve. So now, we're going to introduce the number i, which is this number right there. So i is equal to the square root of negative 1. This kind of phenomena or understanding of complex numbers kind of talks into a whole new field of mathematics known as complex analysis. But I'm not going to get into that too much in the linear algebra because that's an entire course on its own. But basically, all you have to know here is that the square root of negative 1 is a quantity known as i. Consequently, this also implies that i squared is equal to negative 1. And as I mentioned, a is known as the real part, and b is known as the imaginary part. So, we can now think of numbers as complex numbers. And we can think of them as having some real component to them and some imaginary which will component to them. The imaginary component would just basically be this kind of concept right there where the square root of uh, negative 1 is i. It's called imaginary because these numbers don't actually exist in our heads. I mean, they're just numbers that we kind of make up to explain real life phenomena a little bit more better. That seems kind of contradictory, but trust me on this when I say that these the idea of complex numbers is profound in real-life applications. Okay, so let's give some examples of complex numbers. So, for example, something like z equals 7 plus the square root of 2 times i is a complex number because it's in the form a plus bi. So in this case, for example, the real part the real part, which we can usually denote as the RE of Z, and the imaginary part, we can usually denote as the IM of Z. So here, the real part of Z would be equal to 7, and the imaginary part of Z would be equal to the square root of 2. Okay, 
So that was fairly straightforward. Let's do another example. So if z is equal to the square root of 2 minus i, well, in this situation, the real part of z would be equal to the square root of 2, and the imaginary part of z in this situation would be equal to minus 1. Okay, and finally, let's talk about a very kind of special example right here. Let's suppose I tell you that z equals 2. Well, this might seem a little bit weird because you might think, oh, where's the imaginary part? Well, that's fine. Here, I'm just saying that the real part is equal to 2. And because I don't, I don't have any kind of imaginary portion of this, the imaginary portion of z in this case is just 0. So this number is purely real. There is no imaginary part to this. So we can kind of make a conclusion as a result. So uh, we can also conclude that all real numbers are technically also complex numbers. It's just that for real numbers, the imaginary part is zero. So all real numbers are also complex numbers. So let me just go ahead and write that down. So they're also all complex numbers. So that's very interesting. So basically any real number you can think of is technically also a complex number. It's just that the, the imaginary part of this happens to be zero. As a, and then as a final kind of consequence and the other extreme kind of end, if I have another example, suppose I have z equals minus two times i, well, that just means the real part of z is equal to zero and the imaginary part of z in this case is equal to minus 2. So basically that's kind of what's going on here. So if I have a complex number and it's only just a real number, that's fine. It's just that the imaginary part is 0. And if I have a complex number and it's only imaginary, well that's fine. It just means the real part is 0. So this is known to this is called purely real. Oh, sorry. This is purely imaginary and this is purely real. Okay. Now let's talk about the complex plane for a second. So the complex plane is uh, essentially just the, the 2D axis, but instead of using X and Y, we call them a little bit of a, of a different kind of thing. So this Y axis now, or at least formerly what was a Y axis, is known as the imaginary axis. And the X axis, what was formerly called, is the real axis now. So if I give you some complex number a plus bi, well, in this case, a and b are both positive. I haven't changed the sign in any way. So in this case, the real portion of this would be a, and the imaginary portion of this would be b. So that's basically what's going on there. And finally, as a kind of a pretty obvious but important note, two complex numbers are said to be equal if the components are equal to each other. So let me just go ahead and write that down. So two complex numbers, suppose I call them z1 is equal to a plus bi, and suppose I have another one, z2, so let me just fix that a little bit. So suppose I have another complex number, this one is z2 equals c plus di, are equal if, and only if, so uh, IFF, so if and only if A equals uh, C and B equals D. So basically, this is what's going on if two complex numbers are equal to each other. Fairly obvious, but I think the point I am trying to make is fairly important here. Okay. So now let's talk about the idea of a complex conjugate. So let me just go ahead and write that down. So the complex conjugate. Okay, so suppose I tell you that z equals a plus bi. So if z equals a plus bi, or equivalently, if z equals a plus ib, that's the exact same thing. It doesn't matter if I switch the order of multiplication, even in complex numbers, it doesn't matter. So if z equals a plus ib, then by definition, the complex conjugate, so z bar 
So this little thing we it's just it's called Z bar. So Z bar equals A plus I B bar, which by definition, so Z bar is equal to A minus I B. So we just fix that. Is called the complex conjugate. Okay, so basically what's going on here is that if I give you some complex number a plus ib, then the complex conjugate, which is denoted by z bar, is a minus ib. So this is known as the complex conjugate. This is known as the complex conjugate of some complex number z. So fairly straightforward to understand, I hope. So basically, I just kind of change the plus sign to a minus sign, and that is known as my complex conjugate. So intuitively, that should hopefully make sense. So it's kind of like the conjugate of back when in high school you did the, you multiply by the conjugate of a square root. You just change the sign in the middle. That's kind of what's going on here. You just change the sign in the middle. Okay, so now let's take a look at what's going on here. So if, so let's talk about some rules of this. So some rules, so to speak. Okay, so some rules for complex conjugates. So the first one is if z equals a plus ib, then by definition, I'm not going to prove any of this because they should be fairly standard, but if you want me to do a video on where I do proofs of this, just let me know in the comments. I'll be happy to do them. So if z equals a plus ib, then z times its conjugate is equal to a squared plus b squared. That's really cool because that makes things a lot easier to compute rather than just, you know, foiling everything out. You'll notice that every time, every time you multiply by the conjugate, you will always get a squared plus b squared. Okay, so that's pretty cool. So the next one, if z, okay, so assuming that z equals a plus ib, so if I take Actually, let me just write the whole thing down. So if z equals a plus ib, then this will give us the following. Then this will give us z plus its conjugate, or its complex conjugate, will always be equal to 2 times its real portion. So that's important. And once again, you can check this yourself. Just switch the order, just switch the sign, and you'll get the exact same thing. Okay, now let's do this in the opposite way. If z equals a plus ib, then we get the situation that if we go z minus z bar, well, that's going to be equal to 2 times the imaginary portion of z. So, once again, very similar, but they're not quite the same thing. Okay, so now let's talk about the, the next rule. If I take the complex conjugate of the complex conjugate, that's going to just equal the original complex number. And that should make sense. If I, if I just undo a negative sign, I'm just going to get back to plus sign. So that should intuitively make sense. Uh, and just to, be very clear, just to be very clear, this is for some complex numbers that equals a plus ib. I have this kind of disclaimer everywhere, but just for the sake of completeness, I'm going to write this down everywhere. So here, if z equals a plus ib, and w equals c plus id, well, this is going to tell us the following. So this means that z plus or minus w, and if you take the complex conjugate of this sum or difference, this is going to equal the complex conjugate of z plus or minus the complex conjugate of w. Okay, so let's do the next one. If I have the comp, so if, so let me just, this time I'm just copy paste this because it's the same thing or the same condition. So in this situation, so copy paste. So if z equals a plus ib and w equals c plus id, well, we're going to get the following that z times w, complex conjugated all together, so the product of the complex numbers. Uh, conjugated is going to be equal to the 
con complex conjugate of the individual complex numbers multiplied together. So let me just go ahead and write that down. So basically, if I take the complex conjugate of a product, that's equal to the complex conjugate of the individual complex numbers multiplied together. All right, and finally, if, so we just go ahead and paste this again. So same condition, if z equals a plus ib and w equals c plus id, well, that's going to give us z over w complex conjugate is going to be equal to complex conjugate of z over complex conjugate of w. Okay, very interesting. So basically what's going on here is that I've just described a bunch of rules that can be used to work with the idea of a complex conjugate. So let's do an example of this. Okay. So let's talk about this example. So suppose I tell you, okay, uh, actually before I do this example, I should probably talk about the, the arithmetic rules of the complex numbers. So let's go ahead and do that. So this is complex arithmetic. So basically, how do we add, multiply, divide, and subtract complex numbers? Again, these aren't very difficult, but it's important to kind of go over them because otherwise doing operations with complex numbers becomes a little bit weird. Okay, so the first one, so for two complex numbers, so for two complex numbers, Z1, equals a plus bi and z2 equals c plus di, we have the following kind of arithmetic properties or rules, so to speak. So this is going to be a plus bi plus c plus di. Well, that's going to be equal to a plus c plus b plus d times i. So basically, I'm just going to add the real components together and add the imaginary components together. So this is the real components, and this is the imaginary components. So I'm just adding the individual real components together and the individual imaginary components together. And that is the real kind of, uh, well, not real. This is the, this is the addition rule, essentially. So this is addition. Okay, so let's talk about the next one. So this one would be subtraction. So if I have a plus bi minus c plus di, this is gonna be equal to a minus c. So we just fix that. And then this is gonna be a minus c plus b minus d times i. So let me just make sure I did that correctly. So, yeah, that looks okay to me. So this is the rule of subtraction. Okay, now multiplication is a little bit different. So this one I'm not, this one I'm actually going to show. So if I have a plus bi, and I multiply this by some complex number c plus di, well, what we're going to do is use the distributive property. So if we go ahead and use the distributive property, well, we're going to get distributions like this. So let's go ahead and do this piece by piece. So this is going to give us EC plus EDI plus BCI plus BDI squared. But I squared is equal to minus 1. So we're going to get, as a result, we're going to get minus BD. So I'm just going to write that down. Okay. So that means as a result, if we kind of combine the real components and the imaginary components together, well, we're going to get AC minus BD plus, uh, let's take a look here. So this is going to give us AD plus BC times I. And this would be the result of our multiplication. Okay, now let's talk about division finally.
So if I have two complex numbers z1 and z2 being divided, so in other words, if I have z1, uh, z1 over z2, okay, that's equal to a plus bi divided by c plus di. Okay, so if I go ahead and do this, well, technically we're done, but we can make this a bit nicer. So what we're going to do is multiply this by the complex conjugate. So we're going to multiply this by c minus di over c minus di. So if we do that, well, according to the rule just above, we can just multiply these complex numbers together. So if we go ahead and do that, well, we're going to get a plus bi times c minus di divided by c plus di times c minus di. But remember that when you multiply a complex number by its conjugate, so let me just go back up a little bit for you. If I multiply a complex number by its conjugate, we just get the sum of its components squared. So that makes the bottom calculation significantly easier to, uh, to perform. So we just have to finish the top part now. So if you go ahead and finish the top part, well, let's just go ahead and do the numerator. So that's going to be AC minus AD times I plus BD uh, plus BD times I, or let's make sure that's right. So AC minus ADI, yep, that looks good. And then plus BC, that should be a C, plus BC times I. And then plus minus, so we get plus or minus minus BD times I squared, which is minus 1. So that's going to be the numerator. And as we just mentioned, the numerator is just simply going to be C squared plus D squared. So that the, so the bottom calculation is significantly easier to perform. So now if we go ahead and combine these two things, we're, we're going to get AC plus BD divided by c squared plus d squared and on the top we'll get if we factor the i's out and i don't mean that i don't i don't mean that literally like an actual i or anything so if we go ahead and pull the i out we'll get ad or not ad but rather bc minus ad over c squared plus d squared times i. And that right there is the result of dividing a complex number. So this is how you divide a complex number. The last kind of rule, so I believe this is rule 5, yes it is. So rule 5, the last one, if I take the reciprocal of a complex number, this is equal to 1 over the complex number. But if you do the math out and then multiply by the complex conjugate and do all the other calculations out, which I'm not going to do, you will end up getting z bar over the absolute value of z all squared. Recall that the absolute value can be obtained like so. So we can kind of talk about it like this. Actually, the absolute value is something I might cover a little bit later. Yeah, I'm going to cover that a bit later as to how I got the absolute value. But rest assured, it will be covered. Okay, but basically, you just have to know that this kind of holds. Now, another way to write the division is the following. We could also rewrite this as z1 times z2 conjugate over the absolute value of z2 squared. Okay, so now let's talk about how I got the actual, well, absolute value. So let's talk about the concept of modulus. So the modulus of a complex number is essentially just the length or the magnitude. So the modulus, so let me just go ahead and write that down. So the modulus is essentially the length. I don't want to say magnitude because that implies we have a vector, but we could say the length of a complex number is the modulus. So the modulus is essentially just the length of a complex number. Well, how do you measure the length of something? 
If you recall from the previous videos where we measured distance, it's kind of the same thing. So the, how do you actually measure the modulus? Well, the absolute value of the complex number, so that's where this comes from, is equal to the square root of z multiplied by its complex conjugate, which is equal to the square root, because we know what this is equal to. This is equal to e squared plus b squared. And this, of course, assumes that we have some complex number. So we just scroll up a bit. So this, of course, assumes we have some complex number. So for some z equals a plus bi. So given, so for, let me just fix that bit. For some z equals a plus bi. Okay. So given some z equals a plus bi, the modulus of the complex number is equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared. So nothing too crazy. So as an important kind of consequence of this, the absolute value of a complex number squared by definition is equal to e squared plus b squared. This one is very important. In fact, I'm actually going to box both these uh, f, uh, these kind of the. Uh, box both these results because these are both very very important so especially the second one the second one is actually probably the more important one so i'm actually going to start that but regardless my point is that we have now defined the modulus and that's that's where this absolute value actually comes from so as you can see this squared of an absolute value kind of pops up pretty often okay so now let's do a several kind of examples. So let's talk about the first example. So find, so let me just fix that writing a bit because that was really messy. So find the value of A in which, in uh, which, z equals a plus 3i over 3 plus i is a real number. Okay, so how do we do this? We could just, you know, guess and check this until this works and then kind of go from there. But that's not really a an efficient way of doing this. So let's talk about how to actually approach this. We have the complex number a plus 3i over 3 plus i, and we want to forcefully pick a so that these i's go away and we only have a uh, real portion. So how do we kind of go about doing this? Well, one thing we could do is we could multiply this by the complex conjugate and see what happens when we write this in the form of a plus bi. Okay, so as a kind of a, another aside, if I multiply a complex number by its complex conjugate, I will always get it in the form a plus bi. This will always happen. So let's go ahead and kind of write it like that. So if I go ahead and expand this, well, we're going to get a plus 3i times 3 minus i. And then on the bottom, we're going to get 3, uh, 3 plus i times 3 minus i. But we can just write that as 3 squared plus 1 squared. Because more or less, remember, if you multiply something by its complex conjugate, we can just, we can just write each of the components squared added together. So now let's go ahead and expand this. So we get 3a minus ai. Let's see. So now we'll get plus 9i. Uh, let's see. Now here we're going to get plus minus minus, but i squared is minus 1. So we'll get plus 3. And on the bottom, we're going to get a 4. So let me just go ahead and draw a line. Okay. So, oh, we're, sorry, we're not going to get a 4, we're going to get a 9, because 3 squared is 9, 9 plus 1 is 10, so we're going to get a 10. Okay, so now, if we equate, if we kind of rewrite this in the form a plus bi, well, we have to gather the, the real parts and gather the imaginary parts. So if we go ahead and do that, we're going to get 3a plus 3 over 10 plus i 
times 9 minus a over 10. Okay, so we want to make this purely real. So if this is purely real, so let's just kind of read the question just a little bit above. So we want to make sure that this is a real number. So if this is only a real number, this part must be zero. So that means that the imaginary portion of this must be equal to zero. So that means because it has to go away. So that means not nine minus a must over 10 has to equal zero. So that means nine minus a by the by just cross multiplication is going to be equal to zero. And that means nine is equal to a, or in other words, a equals nine. So that so for if I let a be equal to nine, we will get a number that is that is purely real. There will not be an imaginary component to this, and that makes sense because if I plug in nine into this equation, this part just it just it just uh, becomes zero, and this part is just a real number now. So that's great. So that's exactly what we wanted. Okay, let's do the next example. Okay, so this one says compute or find i to the power of 87. So this might be a little bit harder than you think it is, just because you might be thinking, oh, how do I do that? I only know that i squared equals minus 1. So do I have to use that in some way? And you're right, you do. So let's talk about how to actually do this. We know that i squared equals minus 1. So what happens when I multiply by i again? Well, this means i cubed equals minus 1 times i, which by definition is minus i. So what happens when I go i to the power of 4? Well, i to the power of 4 is just equal to minus i times i, but i squared is equal to minus 1. So we get minus 1 times minus 1, or just 1. Okay, so this just means that for every multiple of i to the 4, we're going to get 1. So i to the 4 is 1, i to the 8 is 1, i to the power of 12 is 1, etc, etc. That's very interesting. So can we rewrite i to the 87 in terms of 4? We can, but it's not that obvious. So let's kind of think about how to approach this. So one thing we could do is we notice that 87 is the same thing as 20. So what's the so before I actually talk about this, so let's talk about what's the closest number we can pick for 87 that's divisible by 4. Well, let's just kind of think about this. Well, we could pick 20 times 4. That's pretty close to 20 times 4 is 80. So can we, pick a, okay, so can we go a little bit higher than that? Well, so let's pick 21, for example. 21 times 4. Well, that's equal to 4 times 1 is 4. 4 times 1 is 8. So we get 84. Okay, can we go a bit higher than that? No, we can't. Because if we go ahead and do this... That's going to be equal to 88. That's that's higher than our power. So the closest number we can get is an 84. And how many are how many are we away from 87 as a result? We're three away. So one thing we could do is rewrite this as i to the power of 4 to the power of 21 plus 3. Because that's much easier to deal with now. Because now we know that i to the power of 4 is 1. So this is 1 to the power of 21, and then we multiply this by i cubed. And the reason we can do that is because of exponent laws. So let me just go ahead and kind of not skip that step and just show you what I actually did. So we can rewrite this as i to the power of 4 to the power of 21 times i to the power of 4. Sorry, not i to the power of 4. We could write this as i to the power of 3. Okay, so now we're going to get i to the power of 21, or sorry, not i to the power of 21, we'll get i to the power of 4, but that's equal to 1, so 1 to the power of 21 times i cubed. But 1 to the power of 21 is just equal to 1, and i cubed is just equal to minus i. Okay, that's very nice actually. So because now we can rewrite this as minus i. So if this part can confuse you, let's just think about it like this. We can always rewrite an exponent in the following way. We can rewrite 87 as the following. So i to the power of 4 times 21 plus 3. And by exponent loss, we can split this as i to the power of 4 
times 21 plus i to the power of 3. And then we can rewrite this as i to the power of 4, uh, like that, to the power of 21. So that should be a times, times i to the power of 3, which is exactly what I did there. So hopefully that kind of made sense. So let me just go ahead and erase this redundant step. Okay, so if you have any questions about this example, let me know in the comments and I'll be happy to answer. But that takes care of that example. So we just go ahead and box that. Okay, now let's do the next example. So, Okay, so this one is a particularly interesting example. So let's talk about this one before I go any further. Okay, so this one says, use induction to show that i to the power of 4n is equal to 1. So basically any multiple of 4, of 4 and i to the power of any multiple of 4 is equal to 1. So basically, I kind of did that in the last example where I actually just kind of intuitively talked about why anything raised to the power of 4 for imaginary numbers. So any so when i is raised to the power of 4 is 1, i raised to the power of 8 is 1, etc, etc. So basically, I'm going to be justifying that in general, i raised to the power of any multiple of 4 is equal to 1. So let's talk about how this works using induction. Okay, so we want to show that this is true for all n equals 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. So any integer, essentially. Or not integer, but any uh, natural number. So let's go ahead and prove this. So the base case. Okay, here, for n equals 1, well, we're going to get i to the power of 4, which is e which is the same thing as 1, but that's equal to the right-hand side, which is 1. So we're done. So that was fairly easy. Just So just to be very clear, i to the power of 4 is equal to i squared times i squared, but i squared is just 1, so we get 1 times 1, which is just 1. So we're done. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to make sure that we're clear on why i to the power of 4 is 1. Okay, so now for the induction hypothesis. We get the following. So now we're going to assume i to the power of 4k is equal to 1 for some n equals k. Okay, and then for the induction step, we're going to get the following. So for the induction step, well, we replace all the k's with k plus 1's. So we get i to the power of 4 times k plus 1. Well, that's equal to i to the power of 4k times i to the power of 4. But we, but we assumed that i to the power of 4k is 1 because of our induction hypothesis. So that's fine. That's just 1. And then i to the power of 4, we know that's 1 as well. But that's equal to 1. So that means no matter what we pick, i to the power of 4 to the k plus 1, well, that's always equal to 1 by definition. So we're done. So therefore, because the statement holds for n equals k plus 1, so because statement holds for n equals k plus 1, the statement holds in general in general so we're done you have used induction to kind of prove this okay now let's do another example of this so this is a fairly simple example but it's important to kind of cover all our topics that we're talking about here so let's kind of just talk about this one so if z equals 6 minus 3i what is the modulus? Well, the modulus of this, well, is going to be 
the square root of its real component squared plus its imaginary component squared. So that's going to be equal to 36 plus 9, and that's going to be equal to 45. But that is the same thing as 9 times 5. So by definition, we can rewrite this as 3 times the square root of 5. And that is our final answer for this question. So very simple example, but it was it is important that we kind of cover all our examples for this particular type. Okay, so now let's do another example. We have two more examples to cover. So let's go ahead and do these. So example. Okay, so for this example, we have the following. So example. So show that z, no, sorry, not z, show that the real part of z is equal to 0 for z is equal to i plus i to the 2018 divided by i minus i to the 2018. So basically, I'm trying to show that this number right there is purely imaginary. There is no real component. You might be tempted to say that there's it's already obvious because there's all the i's there. But you have to prove this rigorously. How do you know that some combination of real numbers isn't... Um, sorry, let me correct that. How do you know some combination of imaginary numbers isn't real? Like, how do you know that i to the 2018 isn't a real number? And that combination with i isn't a real number? How do you know that? So, this is something you have to justify a bit more rigorously. So, let's talk about how to do that. So, z equals i plus i to the 2018 divided by i minus i to the 2018. And then here, let's go ahead and simplify this a bit more. So we're going to get i plus, so what do we do with this? So one thing we can do is recognize that 2016 is the same thing as 4 times 504. Why is this important? Because we know that i to the 4 is equal to 1. So if you can write this in powers of 4, this is much easier to deal with. We additionally also know that i squared is equal to minus 1. So that means as a result, 2018 is the same thing as i to the 4, or let me correct that, it's the same thing as 4 times 504 plus 2. So it, let's go ahead and rewrite our powers in that kind of format. So what you can do is rewrite this as i to the 4 to the 504 times i squared. And then we can divide this by i minus i to the 4 to the 504 times i squared. Okay, but i to the 4, as we just talked a moment ago, is equal to 1. So as a result, this is equal to the following. So this is the same thing as i plus 1 times minus 1. And then here, we're going to get the following. So in this situation, we're going to get i plus 1. Because, let's just make sure this is all correct so far. Because, yeah, that's equal to 1. So, and i squared is equal to minus 1. So we're going to get i plus 1 as a result. Okay. So far, so good. So let's just go ahead and simplify this. So this is the same thing as i minus 1 divided by i plus 1 and then we can kind of work with this a little bit more so one thing we can recognize right away is we can rewrite this into in a little bit more of a nicer format if we rewrite this a little bit beforehand so one thing we can do is write this as minus 1 plus i divided by 1 plus i and then we can multiply this by the complex conjugate. So we're going to get 1 minus i divided by 1 minus i. So basically, I just multiplied this by the complex conjugate of the denominator because that lets us eliminate the denominator as a result. So if you go ahead and do that, well, let's see what happens. Okay, so we just scroll down a bit. 
Okay, so now what happens is the following, because now we're going to get minus 1 plus 2i plus 1, and then we divide this by 1 plus 0 plus 1, or in other words, just 1 plus 1. So this is going to give us minus 1 plus, uh, let's see, minus 1 plus 2i plus 1, so the minus 1 and the plus 1 cancels, so we get 2i divided by 2. And this equals i. So that means as a result, we can now conclude that because of this, the real part of this is equal to 0. And we can just, we can just kind of write that down. So the real part of z is equal to 0. And the reason for that is because this number right there is purely imaginary. There is no real component to this. So as a result, we can kind of conclude right away that the real part of this complex number is indeed equal to zero and we are done. So with that, let's move on to the next example. So let's... Okay, so example. So let me just undo that accidental zoom. Okay. So example. Okay, so here I'm gonna do the following. So let Z be a complex number, be a complex number such that the absolute value of Z plus 9 is equal to 3 times the absolute value of Z plus 1. So find the absolute value of z. Okay, so this isn't so bad. So let's just, you know, write this out. So z plus 9 is equal to 3 times the absolute value of z plus 1. So that's fine. So we know by definition that the absolute value of a complex number is equal to square root of its component squared. So let's just go back up a little bit. We also had another rule. So if you just go back all the way back up, right here. So the, if I multiply two complex numbers together, we get this. So that's gonna be a little bit helpful. We also talked about the idea of modulus. So let me just go back down to the modulus. So right here, the absolute value of a complex number is equal to Z times its conjugate or it's complex count you get. So let's go ahead and use that kind of assumption right here. So let's see how this works. So this is gonna be equal to the square root of z plus nine. So we just erase that. So z plus nine times the complex conjugate of this. So that's gonna be z plus nine bar is equal to 3 squared, that's 9, uh, sorry, I, I, I went a bit ahead, that's still, that's still going to be 3 times, let's see, that's going to be, let's just fix this a little bit, so that's going to be the square root of z plus 1 times z plus 1 complex conjugate. Okay, so now what we can do is square both sides, so that will eliminate the square roots, so we get z plus 9 times the complex conjugate of z plus the complex conjugate of 9, but the complex conjugate of a real number is just the number itself. So because we have this rule that if I have the complex number of the whole thing being added or subtracted, that's equal to the complex number of each one individually, like that. So that's kind of what I, that's kind of what I used here. Okay, so here we'll get 9 times z plus 1 times complex conjugate of z, so we just erase that, plus complex conjugate of 1, but that's just 1. So if I go ahead and expand all of this, we'll get z times z conjugate plus 9z plus 9z bar plus 81 equals 9 times z z conjugate plus z plus z conjugate plus 1. 
Okay, so now if I go ahead and expand everything, well, we know by definition that's equal to the modulus or the absolute value of z squared. I guess technically you could call it a modulus, but nevertheless, because of this assumption right here, which I highlighted in red. So if we go ahead and continue with this, we get 9z plus 9z squared. So we can't really do anything about that. So let's just kind of leave it. Although I suppose we could factor the 9 out. So we'll get z plus z conjugate plus 81. And let's just expand the right hand side. So this is going to give us 9 times z times z conjugate. That's just conjugate uh, modulus of z squared plus 9z plus 9z uh, conjugate plus 9. So if we go ahead and simplify all of this, well, we'll get modulus of z squared plus 9z plus 9z bar plus 81 equals 9 absolute value of z or modulus of z squared plus 9z plus 9z bar plus 9. So these two cancel. So now we're going to get the absolute value or the modulus of z squared plus 81 equals 9 times the absolute value of z squared plus 9. So this means we get 72 equals 8 times the absolute value of z all squared. So 9 is equal to the absolute value of z all squared. And if I take a square root of both sides, because this is a absolute value, it's always going to be positive. So we get 3 equals the, square, uh, the modulus of z. And that's what we need to find, because it said, let z be a complex number, find the uh, modulus of z. So we're done. Okay, so that's it for this video. If you have any questions about any of the examples I did or any of the explanations I wrote, please feel free to comment your questions below and I'll be happy to answer. But otherwise, if this really helped you, please like, comment, share, and subscribe my videos and I'll be very and I'll appreciate it very much. Thank you all so much and have a great day.